Hi, I'm Peter Coffin, and I'm about to say the N-word. Well, you can call me Nathan, or you can call me by my nickname, the N-word. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that uh, this one counts as uh, the N-word. I don't think it's that. Even so, uh, I I'm going to use this sparingly. I'm going to say the name of the film one time, but a trailer for a new film has appeared, and I, I complained a lot about movies being made about movies or art being made about art, particularly the creation of art in movies. And I got a real monkey's paw type response from the universe on this one. It's called The American Society of Magical Negroes. I'm maybe being a little overcautious about the N-word. That's not the N-word. Uh, I'm just trying not to be an asshole because I'm pretty sure that I'm probably going to say something that gets me called an asshole in this video. So let's just, let's just, let's watch the trailer. That way you can know what this is, and, and then and then we'll talk about it. I know you can feel their discomfort, Aaron. Watching you walk through a room full of white people was the most painful thing I've ever seen. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, because if you're a marginalized group, you should just be all push your way through that room like a fucking asshole, right? What the fuck are you being polite for, bitch? I don't want to take you to a job interview. There's a recruiting class starting right now, and we got to get you in it. Welcome to the American Society of Magical Negroes. Okay, so the black people are wizards. I, I don't actually hate that. I actually don't think that's a bad idea at all. That's, that's kind of cool. But, uh, why? What's the most dangerous animal on the planet? Sure. White people, when they feel uncomfortable. You know what's fun is there's going to be a certain breed of um, white British guy named Sargon of Akkad that responds to this, stops there, and really proves this thing right. Really hammers it home. A and that's really what people like him exist to do. They exist to, you know, get put out there and show that this is right. They're right to call white people the most dangerous animal in existence uh, when they're uncomfortable. Because, you know, look at this white British guy getting real uncomfortable and saying something that's very questionable. Although he'll cloak it in pretty smart language. Um, he'll sound smart, but uh, it'll, it'll be interesting. You see that white cop guy? That's the look that Sargon is going to make when he sees this, that, that exact look. So on some level, you have to give it to them that they're, they're right, but they're right in a way that's very specific, and we'll discuss after. White people feeling uncomfortable precedes a lot of bad stuff for us. That's why we fight white discomfort every day, because the happier they are, the safer we are. The name needs a little updating, maybe like magical black people or I guess that doesn't have the same ring. Oh man, this guy really is like a black Michael Sarah, isn't he? Wow, what a perfect guy to put in, in into this role. Got that awkward Woody Allen charm with the millennial look, but black. Your first client is a Jason Munn. His morale is far too low. Hey. Hey. Darn it. I was hoping there was a station right next to him. Oh, is this one spoken for? No. Yeah, it's actually fun and weirdly relaxing. It's like being a secret agent with none of the danger. So our protagonist's job is to enter the life of one Jason, a man who is filled with white tears, way too low in morale, becoming a very dangerous animal. You know, he's got that vibe of somebody who's about to snap and go full-ass clan on some black folks, I guess. Real supremacy energy, this one. I, I will say, for this to work... They definitely need to work on that. Like, that guy's red, white fragility, okay? That guy did fine in the DEI thing. And given that all of the black people in this film are dressed like common, which is basically a walking symbol of gentrification, that's the standard for not racist that they're probably going by. Woke. 
I, I don't know. I just I feel like the trailer, in order for it to work, should actually establish white people as a threat. Um, up till this point, it really just kind of relies on the idea that the audience assumes white people are bad. And and I'm not telling you that white people can't be bad or are just not racist, because there's plenty of racist people. And I'm not just saying people with pointy hoods on. I, I'm saying, like, th there are people like Jason here that are racist. I'm, I'm not going to say that that's not a thing. It's just, I, I don't know, I, I feel like there aren't any stakes truly established here. It's like being a secret agent with none of the danger. Shouldn't there be danger if the premise of this movie is to be believed? Like, this man is very uncomfortable, and that's the danger, right? That's the stakes that are established. He's uncomfortable, and that's when bad things happen for black people. Except... Hey, I'm Lizzie. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. She's great. Yeah, she's cool. You kidding? Come on, man. She's smart and funny. And I know what you were doing going on about her. You're trying to set us up. No, no, no. That's not what I was doing. You cannot have a relationship with Lizzie now. Well, that escalated quickly. We're really doing the trailer shows everything that happens in the film thing, aren't we? You cannot have a relationship with Lizzie now. Because if you don't put Jason first, everyone's magic will fail. What the fuck is that? That's such an arbitrary rule. That's weird. Like, the black people's magic is dependent on if it is subservient to the white people. I get that this is a satirical film and that they're making a point about a trope. I understand that. But that's a really weird rule. I've always felt like it's my job to make white people feel comfortable, and here it literally is. But maybe it shouldn't be. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of think that we all get that at this point, right? I really don't think that it should be black people's responsibility to keep white people happy and calm. I think that that's dumb. I think that that's not good. I think that the trope that they use in films and when there are expectations placed in real life, because that's what representation is, it's ultimately a, a dictation of norms for society to understand things are supposed to be like. Uh, yeah, I think we get it. I think we understand. I think that that's uh, every person old enough to be the protagonist in this film has been raised to believe that. Not, not everyone, most, most people. I shouldn't say every, because that, that would be, that'd be wrong. I got a great plan to ask her out, but I'm going to need your help. Do you think you can, like, work your magic? Hey, is he talking about me? Hey. Oh my, wait, are you? So we've just completely abandoned the concept of the film. So I think what we need to understand is that there are two films that we're going to see when we see this. So it may be a very long one. The first half, or the first film, depending on how you want to dichotomize it, is black Harry Potter satire of an overused trope. The second half, or second film, is uh, now that you understand the conceits of the world, here's a romantic comedy. Michael Sarah wants to get with the girl, but the cool normie uh, also does. Just so you know, Michael Sarah gets the girl. But I travel along. Someone defied the society. Who was it? You didn't let her go like I told you. If you interfere with her or your client, you could have your memory erased. There's just all these weird arbitrary rules. Like, why do they have magic? Why do they have it? If this movie doesn't answer the question why they have magic, it's going to be a serious problem. Because if you leave that without an answer... If you're just like, well, there's magic people. And also, there's all these weird rules that are arbitrarily tied up into making sure that black people are serving white people. Then the message really is that black people are a subservient race to white people. Like, the spiritual, supernatural, or just plain universal quantum forces of the universe made it so by uh, literally subordinating them to white people via magic. Like, there really has to be an explanation why they have magic. And it can't be that it's just like that. You won't even remember she existed. Even though we might never see each other again, I need you to know that what we had was real. I'm curious to see how you're going to make it out of all this. 
So in an interview with Kobe Levy, the writer and director of this film, BET asked, you said you're not particularly a fan of the magical Negro stories out there, so where did the premise of your movie come from? That desire to see something else? Libby responds with, it all sort of starts with the magical Negro trope. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but just to define it on my own terms, I think of the magical Negro as a kind of stock black character, a black best friend character who is only focused on helping the white hero. They don't really have an inner life, and they don't have their own things going on. They're just relentlessly focused on helping this white character grow in most cases, and I always thought that was so funny. For whatever reason, the idea there's a white writer who pictures the thing we do in the morning is getting up and trying to help them. I found it so absurd and incorrect and funny that I wanted to blow it out and criticize it, but also use it as a way to talk about other stuff. What it's like to grow up as a black person in this culture and some of the wild and fantastical things we have to do to survive. To me, that's the origin story of the film. So coming from this perspective, you can completely understand what this is supposed to be. He is completely correct uh, that this trope exists. It's been in many films, in many books, uh, in, in a lot of media. I think that a lot of woke media, stuff that allegedly is kind of fighting this type of stuff, actually ends up being the magical Negro trope. It's not just black people that they do it with either. It's often indigenous people or various other minority people. I alluded to it during the trailer, but I made a documentary about how representation isn't like just like the simple uplifting of voices. It's actually how model minorities, um, which is the dictation of norms, rules, standards for minority groups via a favorite minority, a token minority that is represented to them. Representation is more often that than it is anything else. It's a means to transmit ideology to a group. Ideology being two things, um, what the ruling class wants from them and justifications for the fact that there is a ruling class and that they're allowed to want things from them. As Karl Marx said, the ruling ideology is the ideology of the rulers. Based on what I know about movie trailers at this point, which is that they jam as much of the movie into them as is humanly possible, I am very concerned that he did not make the thing that he set out to make. BET understands exactly the issue that I am attempting to highlight in saying that because they asked Libby, for the people who aren't familiar with this trope, were you worried that the movie's message would be lost on them from the title alone? Libby responded, not particularly, because it's one of those things that, like, even if you don't know the term, you know. It's Spike Lee's term. He's the one who coined it. You know that the black character is just there to nebulously be black in the background. They're not really a person, and we can all picture it. Beyond the movie, we all know what it's like to feel pushed to the side and have somebody else pushed to the front. And uh, BT was right to ask that question, and that was the wrong answer. If I were to talk about tropes in media somewhere that isn't social media or a college campus... I would have to explain what a trope is. And it's not because people are, are dumb or anything like that. They're not. It's just that is not how people talk about films. That's insider baseball. It's something for people who are aware of uh, the literary canon, uh, writing technique, et cetera, et cetera. I I'm willing to bet that there are a bunch of people from various races that misunderstand it. The last thing I want to address is the answer he gave to BET asking about the love story. They asked how that plot came about, and Libby answered, to me, so much of this movie is about being seen as a stereotype. The work I satirically ask the cast to do is to sort of lean into being seen as a stereotype for this convoluted mythological purpose. But if part of the movie is about being seen as that stereotype, being looked at and appreciated by someone who loves you is the opposite of that feeling. At least, in my experience, when someone really loves you and really sees you, 
you feel completely regarded as a human, and being seen by someone who loves you is the opposite of being seen as a stereotype. It's a perfect fit for this story about who's fully regarded as a person and who's regarded more as a background character. I wanted that element in here too, so it's not just a criticism of this trope. It's also a hopeful and joyful opportunity to say, hey, this is what it can make us feel like when someone really sees you, as opposed to the way maybe some of these white authors might see us. And I just want to say that this is some very high-minded stuff that I admire the intention behind. But you guys saw this trailer too, right? And you guys know the relationship between movie trailers and movies nowadays, right? Like, I I'm not going to say that it is impossible they pull some kind of switcheroo regarding this. I'm not. But that trailer really looks like two movies that are almost unrelated to each other. Kind of just depicting a trope and being a very typical romantic comedy looking thing. In fact, the second half of the film is kind of like if the genie was the main character and wanted to get with Princess Jasmine and Aladdin kind of wanted to but didn't really want to. So there's not really a lot of conflict. The conflict is actually based in this other story that looks like it's nearly discarded after the first half of the film. Like, I kind of expected to sit down and talk mostly about representation here. A and this is very much an example of that kind of representation movie that I think misunderstands what it's really doing. Again, representation is sold as a means to change people's standing in society, but it's not. It's a reflection of people's standing in society. It's a reflection that a consumption path has been cleared for that demographic. And it's a means uh, to enforce certain standards, rules, norms on that group. It's a means to disseminate ideology. And to me, this looks like an example of that. But reading what the writer-director says about making the movie, I, I don't really think that he intended it for it to be that movie. Like, I'm sure the fact that all the black people are dressed as common is probably a joke. The problem is, I really do think this is a piece of art that is just going to backfire. The trailer and the director's intent with the trailer don't seem to match that well. It comes off like it's trying to have its cake and eat it too, like both with wokeness and criticism of wokeness. And while I agree that they should be criticized as two halves of the same thing. I did not get that from this. But that's also kind of the point. Like, it's kind of supposed to be a little bit ambiguous in that respect. It's kind of supposed to piss off the Sargon of Akkads out there. Because it's kind of supposed to get the racists mad. And it's also kind of supposed to get the woke people mad. And those mad people will talk about it. And I talked about this in the last video about the jack-off pants. Like, I'm effectively doing marketing for them right now as well. But... I am trying to provide some kind of a constructive criticism to it because I, I, I don't automatically view everything with hate like everybody of every political stripe is supposed to do. I certainly view this with skepticism. I don't think that it is going to help with the issue that it's attempting to tackle. I, I don't. I think that this movie is setting itself up to be very misunderstood and not do very well in the box office. And then the director will blame racism or something. You know, like that gay romantic comedy with Billy on the street? You know how that did horribly bad? And I'm going to let you in on, on a little secret. Uh, guys that are exclusively attracted to guys are, are still guys. And while a good romantic comedy from time to time ain't bad, I wouldn't expect that to be a demographic that would in droves show up to support a romantic comedy. And that's not an incorrect assertion. I don't know. Take it from me. I've made a lot of satire that has been misunderstood because I have assumed that the viewer should know what I'm talking about. They don't. And it's not because they're stupid. It's because you're very highly specialized in the subject of conversation you're talking about. Uh, I will say, I do hope I'm wrong. I really do. Like, if this turned out to be a brilliant satire of uh, a trope in media 
that frankly does suck and then somehow managed to make it uplifting with a nice romantic story about being seen. If it actually turns out to not come off like the trailer makes it seem like it's going to come off. I mean, cool. I mean, that's that's not a bad thing. It's just I don't I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that this film is going to be that. And that's all I think I got to say. Um, have a nice night.